Good day, everyone. My name is Ben Odell, and it is a pleasure to be with so many of you here today so that we can talk through the practical toolkit for faith-based and community leaders in the face of the opioid epidemic. We're so glad that you joined us for this presentation, and we're excited to get started. During our time together, we will review the six different strategies outlined in the Partnership Center's practical toolkit that was created especially for faith and community leaders to help guide them supporting prevention efforts, re doing risk reduction, and to provide support for those in their community who are seeking recovery. This webinar is a part of a series of webinars and live streams where we have sought to educate faith and community leaders about the crisis of opioid misuse across the country. If you missed those webinars or the live stream that we hosted at the end of last month, We'll be sending a recording along with the recording of those webinars and the live stream in a follow-up email to everyone who registered to attend. Before we get any further, my name is Ben O'Dell, and I'm with the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships here at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services within the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs. Uh, we, the shorthand for our office that we like to say, we're, we're the Partnership Center, and we work to support faith and community leaders with timely information, best practice sharing, and resources that we hope will help strengthen our community partners' capacity to address so many challenges in local communities, including the opioid epidemic, uh, addiction epidemic that so many communities are struggling with. Uh, and it's, we're working on this, we're focused on it because it's one of the top three clinical priorities for our department, the Department of Health and Human Services. So we hope this next hour will be helpful to you and your community as you seek to respond to this particular challenges in your community is facing and explore practical steps and solutions that can make sense for your community and the people you care about therein. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, this is an educational webinar, which is off the record and not intended for press purposes. If you are a member of the press, please uh, happy to connect with uh, our, you with our press office here at HHS after the program. We welcome your questions and comments throughout the webinar. Um, and let me note too that uh, if you've joined us previously, um, <coughs> excuse me, we're using a slightly different environment today um, for our webinar. You should be able to um, turn up the volume on your computer and hear us through your computer. Another solution if you're having a hard time hearing, if you have the headphones or earbuds that you can connect to your computer through the, the port. Um, plug in those headphones, you should be able to have good audio that way. If you're having trouble, um, again, we will be sending out a recording of this, which should have the audio connected. Um, so if you're having trouble, feel free to uh, touch base with us afterward. We'll make sure you get a copy of the recording where your audio will come through. Uh, but thanks for working with us as we try out this new environment. This environment's going to allow us to have um, as many as 2,000 on, and we had a huge response to this webinar. And so it's great that we can use an environment that will help connect with as many audience members as possible. So thanks for working with us as we try this environment out. So to that point, and so that we can try this environment out even more, we want to invite you to let us know what city, town, or state you're listening from today. So in that environment, you should see a chat box feature, and you should be able to go in there and type in the city and state you're joining us from. So go ahead and do that right now. Jump into that space, um, find where you can type in, and type in what city and state you're joining us from so that we can celebrate and enjoy the fact that you're here with us. Excellent. I'm seeing folks from Connecticut, South Carolina. Excellent. Go ahead and jump in there. Type in your city and state you're from. I see Nebraska. This is excellent. We have so many people joining us today. Um, I'm seeing Georgia, Maryland, South da North Dakota, South Dakota, Massachusetts, Utah. People from all across the country, Delaware, Ohio, are joining us today to, to hear about things that they can do in their community to support and address these challenges. Minnesota, Virginia, Indiana. Really, we have so many people joining us today. It is so great to see everyone here. And again, that feature is where you can type in questions throughout this webinar so that we can answer those questions when we have a Q&A time towards the end. So, 
as you think of them, go ahead and type those right in and we'll be glad to follow up. And as soon as I'm done uh, doing the intro, I'll jump in here and be answering some of those questions uh, and providing as many resources as we can as we go along. So be sure to see that chat box space um, or the question space. I see some people saying they don't see the chat. I see your question. So feel free to do that throughout the presentation and we're excited to have you connect with us in that way. Any questions that we're not able to get to, we'll try and follow up uh, as appropriate on some of those other questions. Um, if you're having trouble with audio, um, and that would be interesting because you wouldn't be able to hear me, um, but if the, the audio should be coming through your computer, so make sure to turn up the volume on your computer or use that um, the, the headphone option. As a final note, and some of you have already asked, we will be emailing a link to the recording of the presentation today, and I'll be answering questions about the PowerPoint and the chat um, as I follow up. So the current uh, opioid epidemic is a priority for HHS and our nation for a good reason. Over the past 15 years, community, communities across our country have been devastated by the increasing prescription and illicit opioid abuse, addiction, and overdoses. According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, with their national survey on drug use and health, in 2016, over 11 million Americans misused prescription opioids, nearly 1 million used heroin, and 2.1 million had an opioid use disorder order due to a prescription opioids or heroin. Since 2000, more than 300,000 Americans have died of an opioid overdose. And preliminary data for 2016 indicates that at least 64,000 drug overdose deaths occurred, the highest number ever recorded in the U.S. So between the statistics and headlines for too many of us, the, what's really hurting us in our communities is the upfront and personal experiences of families and friends who we know are, addicted by this, are affected by this crisis. Um, the epidemic can easily look like a downward and out of control spiral. But every day here in the center, we are also witness to something new and hopeful in smart, compassionate, and innovative communities and initiatives happening in congregations and communities across the country. We see these happening where people live, work, and play and pray, uh, and with, where community members are walking alongside one another. They're literally saving people from dying. They're walking alongside, connecting them to treatment and recovery programs and bringing restoration to the lives of individuals uh, and families in communities. So let's talk about what we can do as a part of this crisis and building on all the education that we've done. I'm so excited to introduce you to two uh, amazing individuals who will be speaking to us today. The first is my colleague here at the Partnership Center, Heidi Christensen. Heidi is the Public Affairs Specialist for the Center uh, and she her efforts focus on strengthening the capacity and, and national, um, on national faith-based and community organizations to respond to critical public health issues. During her tenure at the Partnership Center, Heidi has coordinated coalitions of multiple multi-sector community-based partners to address childhood obesity, chronic disease, and social and economic issues challenging the health of our nation. We also have with us Pastor Greg Delaney, who has served as the Outreach Coordinator for Woodhaven, which is a treatment center known as a safe place to recover. Pastor Delaney is also a frequent faith collaborator with and for the Office of the Attorney General of Ohio and their statewide outreach on substance abuse, as well as Attorney General Patrick Morrissey of West Virginia's Combating Addiction with Grace Initiative. Greg's been an instrumental in a number of initiatives, such as the Champions Network, a coordinated and collaborative network of qualified individuals, community-based services, ministries and churches administering to the addicted in local communities. He also has an ongoing uh, weekday blog called Opportunities for Hope uh, and a we weekly radio show by the same name. Uh, Greg is an active member and advocate for recovery community, a graduate of Wright State University in marketing. has been married to his wife Elizabeth for 28 years and is the father to Hillary, Samantha, and Ian. I'm so excited to have both of these uh, speakers today, so let me turn it over to my colleague Heidi Christensen to get us started. 
Well, thank you, Ben. And a great thanks to each of you for being with us today. I and the team here at the Partnership Center deeply appreciate your taking time out of your day so that we can share this practical toolkit with you and also to hear and learn from our very special guest, Pastor Greg Delaney, who's leading truly inspirational efforts in Ohio and West Virginia. So before we start our walkthrough of the Practical Toolkit, I'd like to flesh out some of those sobering statistics that Ben provided in his introduction. And sometimes pictures just tell a better story than words, and that is certainly true with this epidemic. This time series map from the CDC shows county-level drug overdose mortality rates shifting between 2000 and 2015. Now what we have up on the screen here is year 2000 and blue tones prevail with drug overdose deaths in the 2 to 10 per 100,000 and as we move through the years the counties get hotter. Drug overdoses are among the few causes of death that are on the rise and trends as evidenced here are stark and, and unrelenting. Every state has seen dramatic increases in mortality rates, with some states in the Appalachia and the Northeast and Southwest being among the most hardest hit. Drug addictions and abuse are among the most prevalent, complex, and destructive illnesses in human society. They are found in every segment of our communities, regardless of race, religion, and socioeconomic class, as well as every walk of life. Farmers and musicians, lawyers and construction workers, stay-at-home moms, veterans, high school football stars, and the homeless. And it touches every age with growing numbers of overdoses among older adolescents. Now, we're going to take a closer look at these numbers later in the program. And increased misuse by those 50 and older. And while the various federal agencies under HHS are implementing new prescriber guidelines and putting all scientific hands on deck to develop new medications and technologies to treat opioid addiction, our work today focuses on the community's response to this issue and practical steps that will support those in treatment, the long road to recovery, and lean into the hope of preventive efforts, preventative efforts. So today I'd like to share with you an overview of the actionable areas for congregations and communities that have emerged out of our many, many discussions with faith and community partners who are active in this space and with our subject matter experts here at HHS. And our hope is that wherever your community may be on the scale of possible activity, we look forward to working with you together to stem the tide of this epidemic and preserve the health, safety, and vitality of our communities. So let's jump in and consider the first very practical opportunity of opening your doors and spaces to host community-based recovery and self-help support groups. Now, whether it's an AA, Alcohols Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Teen Challenge USA, Celebrate Recovery, or any other program, finding a supportive community is essential to ongoing recovery. Offering space now is probably the first thing we tend to think of for congregations and communities to do because in most cases they are place-based organizations with space and doors to open to groups and programs. But more importantly, they are community and can help diminish the isolation suffered by those with addiction and immediately connect them to others in community who may also be in recovery. Sam Quinones in his book Dreamland had said, opiate addiction not only promotes isolation, it makes it preferable. Our hope is to increase the number of lifelines that these programs offer and expand the number of communities and congregations who are hosting programs or establishing ways to connect folks to existing groups, peer recovery networks, or even individuals who can support their recovery. Like the Jewish Center for Addiction in Chicago, which has appropriated the traditional practice of matchmaking, but in this case, Rather than making a matrimonial connection, the rabbi is connecting a community member struggling with a substance use disorder to another member of the community in recovery. 
For other communities, prominently posting in your newsletters, bulletin boards, social media, or web pages where the low closest AANA Celebrate Recovery Group is located, or even providing the number for SAMHSA's National Helpline, which is listed up here on the slide, and United Way's 24-7 Local Resources Line, is a simple way of demonstrating your community's awareness and support while making potentially life-saving connections. A second area Oh, here we go. A second area for the work we can do together really reflects the number one request we hear from community leaders, and that is the request to increase awareness and reduce the stigma associated with substance use disorders. The most significant gift that communities can bring to those in addiction or in recovery is to offer acceptance, empathy, and to embrace them with support. We believe that that support is engendered through an understanding of the condition. The National Institute on, Brain, on Drug Abuse, NIDA, defines opioid addiction as a chronic, relapsing brain disease that is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite its harmful consequences. We now know from science and we can see through brain imaging studies that the brains of people who are addicted look different and respond differently when exposed to drugs. And through the repeated use of drugs, the brain actually changes. Addiction is a terrible medical disease that no one would choose to have happen to them. And it is also a chronic condition as the science so far tells us that the changes in the brain are long-lasting changes. And so just like high blood pressure or blurred vision can be symptoms of diabetes, so can the uncontrollable craving for drugs, despite the harm to self and others, be symptoms of addiction. And while we are experiencing a growing awareness of the science of addiction and its chronic long-term nature, we still too often don't give folks any slack for exhibiting the symptoms. Or worse, we ostracize them. I believe we are a nation that prizes perfection. It's reflected in reality television, Instagram shots, and Facebook pages that are just filled with cultivated images and sort of edited versions of our lives. Frankly, I don't know about you, but personally, I'm a little intimidated by how perfect some folks' lives are. And we show up at the gym at school, at church, in our neighborhoods, and our workplaces with absolutely no seams showing, masking the very pieces of ourselves that need the support and understanding of our friends, colleagues, and communities. The good news is that communities are leaning into the effort to challenge old conventions about addiction with knowledge, knowledge that addiction and reoccurrences that can feel like setbacks to individuals and their families are not a personal moral failing, but symptoms of a disease and a chronic condition. As our friends at the West Virginia Council of Churches say, recovery is not about bad people becoming good, but good people becoming well. And they have a terrific video on their website um, that's the result of their 17 statewide listening session called the Pathology of Addiction that um, you may want to check out. That said, a clergy handbook that SAMHSA had written some time ago noted that while we think of welcome and support for persons in need as central to the spiritual meaning of, a of being in a community of faith, often religious communities are not perceived this way by those struggling with addiction and they feel disconnected or even disowned by those communities. Reversing that image requires that communities be both informed and compassionate as they reach out to addicted persons and families. Now, in practical terms, we're encouraging faith and community organizations to partner with their local hospitals or treatment centers, public health offices, or other any other local expert to help educate their communities and replace stigma and shame with an acceptance and empathy that will open doors, hearts, and minds to better serve individuals as well as their families. And communities are doing just that. 
in Georgia, the Northwest Family YMCA invited the Georgia Prevention Project to co-host an all-day drug abuse and heroin use summit for at-risk teens, their families, law enforcement, and other community partners to open a dialogue about substance use and substance use disorders and claim the conversation as a community-wide concern and responsibility. The West Virginia Attorney General's Office visits sporting events to talk with students and parents about the likelihood of a sports injury and how that injury could very well lead to a misuse of opioids. And teaching students and parents to ask before they accept a prescription, is that an opioid? Do I need it? Is there an alternative? Being a good consumer of pain management couldn't be more important. And just the other day, our colleague here at the center spoke to his dentist about pain he was experiencing around a tooth. And according to my co-worker, the pain was manageable. This was not an acute, very painful situation. And the doctor gave him something for his pain and said it was Tylenol. Well, my colleague asked him, is this an opioid? And indeed it was because it was Tylenol number three, which has both acetaminophen in it and codeine which is an opioid, pain medication, and potentially addictive. Now, if he hadn't asked, he wouldn't have known that he was being given an opioid. So he walked out with an alternative that was just a stronger dose of ibuprofen or what most people think of as over-the-counter Motrin. And this is not meant to be medical advice, but rather a strong encouragement to invite local expertise into your community to help educate your members on pain management, the risk of opioid use, and the science of addiction and substance use disorders. And no matter the topic or activity, the message that will emerge from your community and it's actively addressing this public health issue is that the work of recovery belongs here. And in that way, you are extending an invitation to those who need your support the most. So now a third area of focus is to encourage the movement we are seeing in communities to elevate their education and training and build their capacity to the opioid epidemic in their communities. And our team saw the expanded vision of what capacity building could look like when we met Pastor Greg Delaney through the West Virginia Attorney General's Office and their Combating Grace with Addiction program. It's one thing for our team to share what others are doing, but it's more compelling to hear from someone who is doing it in real work in real time. Pastor, thank you so much for being with us today, and I'm going to turn the mic over to you to help address the area of capacity building and community possibility. Pastor? Well, well thank you very much, Heidi, and it's uh, just an honor uh, to be with so many folks from so many different places and uh, actually coming to you today from Columbus, Ohio, and so just grateful to uh, spend a few minutes and talking a little bit about what we have done here, so thank you, Heidi and Ben, and, and for the team at the Partnership Center. Um, just, uh, just so blessed to be able to share. I'm going to go quickly through some things that um, we share here in Ohio as well as West Virginia, and I want to start with a couple of quotes. Um, Brennan Manning, who, who suffered from substance use disorder for a long time, only to go on to write some very compelling uh, faith-based uh, uh, commentaries and books, made the statement that tragedy is that our attention centers on what people are not, rather on what they are and who they might become. And he goes on to say that our hearts of stone become hearts of flesh when we learn where, and I added this, and why the outcast weeps. Those two uh, particular quotes have special meaning to me. Uh, as an individual who is in long-term recovery, uh, I needed someone to get past the tragedy of seeing what I was not and be able to know where I was hurting, where I was weeping, and brought to me a heart of flesh and began to help me through my challenges. And that person was a pastor. And that person came to visit me after a near-death experience, deliver failure from my addiction. And so these two quotes resonate with me in terms of the manner with which we go out and speak to faith community leaders and to churches in terms of setting that, that mindset to say it is a tragedy when we look at folks in a light that looks not to what they can become, but what we really, well, what we think that they are. And yet we still need to keep a sensitivity and a heart of flesh when we're, when we're working with these folks and encountering these folks. 
And so what we've done here in Ohio is we've gone about the business of trying to reset the purpose uh, for the church and for faith leaders and for paraministries around the state. And we've really kind of come back to really simplify things and encourage uh, in our conferences and encouraged in our events uh, to remind and to to make this particular uh, this particular foray into this challenge a mission to look at it missionally. And I firmly believe that if we went back to that passage that was shared, that I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink, I was in prison and you came and visited me. I'm confident that that had that been penned in 2017, that there would have been a line to say I was addicted and you helped me recover. And so we start there in an effort to just kind of reset uh, for those who we're dealing with that this is where we fit. Faith leaders, churches for the longest time have fit into those spaces of meeting need, like hunger, like being thirsty, like going and visiting in, in the prisons, and this is no different. And so we've spent our time over the last two years uh, working to educate and to enlighten and to equip and to engage faith leaders and faith communities and churches as to their role, taking on some of those same things that Heidi mentioned during her part of the talk, uh, to let them know in awareness and places where they can fit and begin to get them engaged. This was all stemming from a question that was raised by our Attorney General here in Ohio about two years ago to ask the question, what is the faith community doing to address the opiate crisis? And from that, we put uh, feet and hands to work. And one of the things that I've been asked to really talk a little bit more about today was how do we go about doing that? What is that strategy in conjunction with his office, but also independently uh, as we work with other leaders and, and faith-based organizations? And one of the things that we do is we empower faith-based and faith-friendly uh, capacity with a couple very simple approaches. When we go into a particular community, be it a county, uh, be it uh, several counties, be it a, a board area, be it um, you know just a, maybe just a town, uh, we will start with don't reinvent anything when you want to go engage this. Take a look and see what's going on around you. Do some research. We have a wonderful partner in Ohio called Relink.org. They're actually in the development of an application to help folks find the resources that they need for recovery. And their founder makes this interesting statement. He says the most common problem for those seeking help is not a lack of capacity of service providers, but a lack of information about those providers. And so our first encouragement to faith-based organizations and churches is to say, take a look around you and research those things that are going on, things like what's going on at your YMCA, things like what are going on maybe in other nonprofits in your community, and begin to understand where they fit in and how you might connect to them. So SAMHSA has come out with a recovery-oriented system of care, and this is a simplification that our organization here in Ohio, the Ohio Association of Community Health and Behavioral Services Authorities, has, has kind of brought to the table. And what I'm most encouraged about this particular recovery-oriented system of care is that faith is invited to the proceeding. But in addition to that, these other pieces that are trying to impact that person in the middle, and that was me, impacting that person in the middle are all of those disparate systems and different social agencies, different things that are all looking to provide help. But one of the challenges with this particular model is that it's all pointing at that individual. And what's tough about that is Heidi had mentioned that there are some serious brain things going on with folks who are dealing with long-term addictive issues. And so asking them to navigate such a complicated system of all the things that they may or may not need is a little too much to ask of anyone. And so what we do is we said, we have a place at the ROSC. We have a place in the recovery-oriented system of care. Faith does. But how can we begin to impact it differently? How can we begin not only to take our seat at the table, but also to improve the overall dynamic of the model? And a couple ways that we encourage uh, groups to come to meet with us is we, we ask them, hey, identify gaps and places of connection within your community based on that recovery-oriented system of care. And one of the best examples I can give, there's three there, but I'll just uh, focus on the first one, and that's the Her Story Contemplation Center. We have an organization here, Her Story, in Greene County, Ohio, which is just uh, kind of east of Dayton. And this was developed by a young lady who was actually working as an intern for Children's Services. 
and she was noting that she had an awful lot of clients who were dealing with substance use disorder. They were going through some significant trials when it came to their children, and often they were not seeking uh, help for their addiction in fear of that. But more importantly, they would seek and get a little bit of help, maybe a detoxification, maybe a trip to the emergency room, but only to find that that next step of treatment wasn't going to be available for a period of time. And in her efforts, she said, look, this is a gap. And so she began to, to formulate in her, uh, in her mind how she could build a contemplation center so that once a girl potentially might have been detoxed, that if she needed to wait for a period, that she could go to a safe place to wait that out where she could continue to be ministered to, continue to be encouraged, continue to be held accountable. And so what came out of this was the 501c3. We connected this particular founder to other organizations that could help her, support her, give her guidance on how to build the center, give her guidance on how to equip the center. And I am happy to tell you that just last Saturday, I sat through her uh, second fundraiser she now has all the funds necessary. She has purchased a house, and she'll be able to begin to help uh, seven women uh, through those situations. And she came out of a church and a faith organization looking for ways to help. So that's one way. The second way is empowering faith-based and faith-friendly capacity by not recreating before you collaborate. Often we will dive headfirst into things, and suddenly we've got some duplication of effort. Instead of trying to just be all things to all folks, let's take a look and see what skills and talents, what gifts that we have within our congregation or within our community or within our faith leadership that we can begin to say, okay, how can I apply that collaboratively to the other things that are going on in my community? And I love what Mother Teresa says. She says, none of us, including me, ever do great things, but we all can do small things with great love, and together we can do something wonderful. I think it has been a challenge for faith, uh, faith groups, churches, to look at themselves as a part of the community in a collaborative way. And one of the things that we have seen is when we do, when we engage in that way, some amazing things begin to happen. Suddenly we become energized to being a part of the community again, to being relevant to the community again. But secondarily, those that are in those other uh, facets of service delivery start to see us as relevant again and start to see us as an amazing untapped resource of volunteer and help. And so a couple of good examples of that is the Understanding is Greater Than Heroin collaborative that's in our Cleveland area of Ohio. It's a six-county collaborative coming together, talking about best practice, meeting together about quarterly, doing things together but not looking to duplicate. In Montgomery County, Ohio, which is close to Dayton, which is, many of you may know is the epicenter of this particular epidemic, we're the worst in the country per capita for overdose deaths. Um, we have developed a community overdose action team. This was fostered out of our mental health and recovery board, but in that same recovery-oriented system of care, they've invited faith to that table. So many church leaders, faith leaders, paraministry leaders are sitting at the table with those other community entities and helping to drive change and policy and solutions for the Montgomery County area. That's the collaborative model. And so if you look at that ROSD again, you look at that recovery-oriented system of care again, here's a preferred one. The same uh, entities, those same systems and solutions around those individuals, but inside, maybe there's someone linking arms with another person. Maybe that is a faith leader that's coming in to help. Maybe that is a pastor or somebody that's a volunteer. But if you take a look at the outside of this, how are they connected? How are we interconnecting each one? I can tell you, interestingly enough, I'm here in Columbus today to get ready to step into a meeting with a group called the Greater Good Ambassadors. They are uh, led by a Six Sigma business specialist who has taken a look at this model and said, look, faith could even be the knitting agency uh, in a particular area to bring these things together. And so when I look at that middle part of us coming together and joining hands with the one who's suffering with substance use disorder, I'm always fascinated and brought back to my dad. My dad's 82 years old. He doesn't know much about addiction other than my own. And yet, um, through the efforts of just encouraging him and he seeing what's going on, he's come alongside a 54-year-old gentleman in our little county. And this guy is doing well. He's in recovery, but he has some limitations. No transportation. He has some you know, family members that have kind of uh, disowned him a little bit. Dad's come along to be family to him but don't mean simple things like providing a little transportation when he needs it, uh, being there if he asks for prayer, 
And recently that, uh, that gentleman's mother passed away, and the first person he called was my dad. And my dad never had an idea that he would ever be involved in helping in the opiate epidemic, but now dad has found his way to be a part of that collaborative and connected community. And so one of the main encouragements that I walk away with when we talk to churches and leaders is, is this quote from Jen Hatmaker. She said, one of the best parts of being human is other humans. It's true because life is hard, but people get to show up for one another as God told us to, and we remember that we're loved and we're seen and God is here and we're not alone. And I love what she says here. We can't deliver folks from their pits, but we sure can get in there with them until God does. That's us getting back to being community. And so some of the on-ramps that we've experienced and, and have, uh, have seen folks undertake here in the state of Ohio uh, are listed there. I think uh, Heidi made mention of opening your doors and starting a group. A couple others that are listed there going down to the parents group. Fascinating uh, outgrowth of a meeting of collaboration this last Monday in Dayton, Ohio, where we, had, we have nine parents who went through a very specialized training to become parent-to-parent -parent supporters. Uh, helping other parents who are dealing with um, uh, children who are, who are suffering from substance use disorder and knowing what to say, how to come along, how to have compassion without being enabling, all of those kinds of things. Prevention efforts that I'm going to speak to in just a second. We've also seen these kinds of things, embracing and joining the coalitions that already exist. Faith, you have a spot at the table. Take your spot at the table. But we've also seen some things like prayer using things like Mark Batterson circles just to go into my neighborhood and make change via prayer. But I highlighted the one at the bottom of foster care. One of the things that the Attorney General here in Ohio has made a, 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 a priority is how do we activate some of our congregants and parishioners into the area of potentially becoming foster care parents, or at least becoming a part of something that we have here called Safe Families. It's a way to provide respite maybe for a family that's, that's in, in, in crisis. We've also seen where young ladies are reluctant to go into treatment centers for help. If a safe family is, is available to take care of their child while they're away without that fear of an entire CSB intervention, that's a good place for a church uh, to fit, a good place for a pastor to encourage a parishioner or a congregant to fit. But what we've also seen in that last, that last bullet there is being creative. Uh, Look at your gifts and talents within your congregation. Look at your gifts and talents within the, the community that you're serving. Um, the Lord is amazing about equipping and providing provision and vision within the communities that we live. And so take a look and say, man, if there's something else that I could be doing or another gap, if I'm not reinventing, if I'm collaborating, then I'm starting to see the areas where I can potentially serve. One such uh, group was a group in uh, Beaver Creek, Ohio which just did a simple plan, a church of about 800, that said we're going to do these three things as a church in order to try to help in the problem. They committed themselves to 30 days of prayer, simple stuff, targeted prayer to the addicted, to those that were trafficking, to all of the law enforcement. They focused their time of prayer. The second thing is they said let's get Narcan training for all of our staff and volunteers because we know that at least in the state of Ohio, and I think this is nationwide, one out of three folks are dealing with this. And so it's not uh, something that the church is immune to, and so we need to be prepared. And so they provided that Narcan training for their staff and volunteers. The last piece was mental health first aid, a free training offered by our mental health and recovery team. They came in and said, here's some things to look for signs of somebody that may be in distress, recognizing that there's an awful lot of why behind everybody's whatever. And often we get so focused on the symptom of addiction that we don't realize that most of it's brokenness and that we have been dealing with brokenness for about 2,000 years. And so these were areas that they used. There was a simple plan, but there was some other simple things. Transportation, as I mentioned with my dad, we've seen folks that provide respite care for grandparents who are caring for their addicted children those kinds of things. Quickly, I want to wrap up in just a couple last things. Heidi talked about her extensive experience with coalition development. One way that we are trying to, to play in this particular space is making sure that our faith leaders are in, embracing the same best practices for their coalition development. So if we've been invited to the table of a grander coalition and there's a subgroup that needs to be focused on the faith interventions and the faith interactions, then we need to do that well. 
And so here in Ohio, we have an Ohio Center for Coalition Excellence that is not a faith-based organization, but one that we leverage their best practice in order to best teach those faith leaders that want to be a part of the solution how to best and most effectively be a part of that solution. And then lastly, uh, two last things. One, this one is how we engage the church. And what we try to do is we'll come into a community and provide an equipping event. Typically happens in a local church. We'll engage a team of local experts. We'll also reach out to all of those that are providing services in that particular community and encourage them to come in during a, a venue, a date. Of, it could be two hours, six hours. It really doesn't matter. It's up to the community. But we reach out to those providers and say, don't tell us what you do. Tell us how we can work together. And we spend time uh, sharing that, and then we bring subject matter experts to provide off-ramps and on-ramps for the church to get connected. We do all that through an equipping event template, and it can be as small as a group of 13 that we had about three weeks ago in a, in a local community here in Ohio, or it can be as grand as a couple hundred, which we just did about four weeks ago up in the Northeast. So those things are just things that we've used here to equip people. Lastly, where there was a mention of prevention, and I will bring this to attention because this is the ultimate collaborative model for us. We had um, uh, a need from our prevention specialists in Montgomery County saying we really need to engage the faith community and helping them deliver messaging of prevention. We said, well, how do we do that? We're past that just say no kind of uh, mentality. And so from their involvement, they came to us with a readiness tool to deliver to the church community. We use their best practice for that. Me as a faith leader and other faith leaders in this particular space, we reached out to get congregational buy-in to say, you folks can provide this uh, information, these prevention tools, these prevention methodologies while you have your students in Sunday school, Wednesday night, Friday night, football parties, all that kind of stuff. They provided us an evidence-based toolkit that's there at the top of the screen from Prevention First based out of Cincinnati. And what's cool about their particular uh, program is that it has a plain glass element and a stained glass element. What I mean by that is the, the methodologies and things that are there have enough of a faith backbone to them that they can be incorporated into current curriculum that's being delivered by the church in a Sunday school setting or a Wednesday night setting or maybe into a, a Friday night lights kind of setting. So this is where we've taken what's going on at a mental health and recovery level, what's happening in the church level, trying to find those gaps, using best practice in order to come to a good toolkit in order to deliver to the faith community. I will tell you that training is going to go on tomorrow. Well, we have five churches that will be a part of that for this first pilot. And the most amazing thing about that is when they walk out of that training, they will have a jump drive of tools and methodologies and programming that they can quickly implement that will be supportive of the other things that are going on in the community. And so all I want to do is say thank you. Hopefully I haven't overgone my time, but uh, I want to thank Heidi and the team. Uh, my information is there on the screen. I'm sure you're going to get it as a part of the linkage. Feel free to call me anytime. I'm happy to, uh, to chat with you about what we have done and go into greater detail here. But my main encouragement is, is to step in and get engaged. There's a place for us at the table, and I think it's time for us to take it, and there are ways that we can quickly and uh, intensely impact this uh, epidemic in a positive way, uh, sharing faith and sharing our, our connections. Thanks so much, and have a great day the rest of it. Pastor Delaney, thank you so much. See, friends, you could see why we really thought it would be helpful if you could hear just, it's just a glimpse of the work that is happening um, under Pastor Delaney's leadership. And, uh, and just thank you sir, for just sharing your story and the rich wisdom that has come from your own personal road to recovery and just the practical life-giving work that you are leading. Um, and, and also just recognizing that each of us has something to bring. The story of your father just stepping in where it can be such a crucial, they say that small, small gestures can be just make such a big difference. So thank you for your time. And I think you may be getting a few questions coming your way, so don't run too far. Um, and friends, Ben has asked me, um, thank you. Ben has asked me to say that if you have a question to ask, to put it in the question box rather than the chat box. So I, I think if, if hopefully that's clear and we'd love to hear from you. So folks, what we want to do while we have um, 
a little bit more time together is run through a few more of the actionable areas in our toolkit today. And uh, one is under the umbrella, and I know that now uh, Pastor, in, in Pastor Delaney's comments, he included a lot, you could hear the work of this toolkit happening, this really integrated in the efforts they're leading up in West Virginia and Ohio. But one of these big areas that we're eager for um, communities to step into is in the work of helping to rebuild and restore people's lives. And drug addiction, as, as it was noted, makes it so hard to function in daily life. I mean, it can affect how one acts with their family, at work, in their community, and it can leave lives of those individuals and families dramatically altered by the loss of a job or their home or damaged relationships. Now, faith and community organizations have been providing these kinds of support services, what our public health folks call wraparound services, for decades. And so the opportunity here is to connect those programs and ministries to the efforts and the support of what SAMHSA has identified as the four major dimensions that support a life in recovery, and that is health, home, purpose, and community. And assisting assistance with housing, assistance with employment, getting back into school, helping folks gain the skills they need to get a job are essential. It's very difficult to recover from a disorder such as opioid addiction if you don't have a stable place to live or you don't have a job. Help with child care, help with getting to appointments like Pastor Delaney's father, connecting folks to basics like food, clothing, and housing are all things that communities offer to individuals that are recovering and are critically important to their recovery. So the question I also wanted to ask is how might your community set, step up its support of our re-entering citizens and our veterans, two populations that are particularly vulnerable as they rebuild and recreate their lives. And community capacity is a especially important in discussing a fifth major area of work which concentrates on youth and prevention efforts and how we're going to get ahead of this problem. Now this past August, the CDC reported that death rates for drug overdoses among those aged 15 to 19 in 2015 were highest for opioids, specifically heroin. Both, for both male and female adolescents, the majority of drug overdose deaths in 2015 were unintentional, meaning that it's possible that the introduction of potent synthetic illicit opioids such as fentanyl, which is 50 times as potent as heroin and fast-acting, are contributing to the increase in overdose deaths, especially among young people. And according to the American Medical Association, prescription opioid exposure remains a path to heroin use. Unnecessary exposure to prescription opioids must be reduced to prevent the development of opioid use disorder in the first place. So it is becoming more and more of an imperative to delay the onset of first and experimental drug use among our young people and to strengthen their resilience to make better decisions for their futures. Now, NIDA is pretty clear that those at highest risk for substance use disorders are adolescents and that we need to elevate protective factors while decreasing risk factors for young people. And that opens the timely and relevant conversation. I know the pastor touched on this briefly about adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, and trauma-informed approaches. Now, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, are traumatic events that happen during childhood and can include physical or emotional abuse, neglect, growing up in a home with an adult who has a substance use or a mental health disorder, witnessing violence in the home or in the community, or having a family member who has been incarcerated. Now, each adverse experience contributes to a score from 1 to 10. And unfortunately, ACEs are far too common, with one out of every five people having three or more ACEs. And it's not the kind of hand any of us would want. Research has demonstrated a strong relationship between adverse childhood experiences and high-risk behavior, including like early initiation of alcohol use, premature sexual activity, um, prescription drug use, and increased suicide attempts. 
our new Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams, made a convincing case in our recent live stream for faith and community leaders when he said that we know that each additional ACE increases the likelihood of early drug use by up to 400%. Fortunately, he continued, we also know what protects children from these adverse experiences and that are nurturing parenting skills, stable family relationships, and caring adults outside the family who can serve as role models and mentors. And faith-based and community organizations are already doing this work around the country. They're implementing programs that support children, teens, and their parents in various ways. But as the Surgeon General has said, supporting children and their families is the work of prevention. So it will remain an important exercise to discern how your community's youth and family programs can be fine-tuned with the intentional integration of approaches such as those that are trauma-informed. Interactions that consider the circumstances that have contributed, contributed to someone's behavior and asking, what happened to you, instead of what's wrong with you. But approaches that build resilience and offer a countercultural environment that may help adolescents align with positive role models and peers, including those peers that are in recovery. Um, have you thought about lifting up the experience of young people in your community who are in recovery and getting them the training they need to lead peer support groups? Or could you host a support group especially for young people, including faith-based programs like The Landing, which is the Celebrate Recovery for Young People, or Teen Challenge USA? And here under the umbrella of prevention, I'd like to pick up the conversation on foster care that Pastor Delaney had started. And we know at HHS we are learning more about the connection between rising mortality rates from drug overdoses and the growing number of foster care caseloads. And this is sadly after decades of decreasing demand. I mean, with so many more children entering foster care, how can we make foster care experience a positive one rather than one that just adds another number to a child's ACE score? And while not all folks can become foster parents, most of us can harness our resources, time, and talents to support them. And in San Antonio, Texas, Grace Point Church started a ministry that supports adopted and foster children and their new families by helping them with yard work, home repairs, or babysitting, providing clothes and necessities like cribs and car seats, or by offering resources for parenting classes. When we talk about hope and healing, this is the hope part. Prevention is where communities Communities can institutionalize hope and break the cycle of high-risk behaviors and addiction. And finally, for today on the sixth area, just as it regards the toolkit, and um, the sixth area kind of, it aims to strengthen the efforts of community-based organizations by encouraging them to collaborate with other community health assets, a term public health folks use to describe the benefits of partners or resources that already exist in the community and can help to inform and expand public health initiatives. This is what Pastor Delaney referred to as the don't recreate before you collaborate. It's the take a look around and see what's already happening. Our Surgeon General had said that addiction is a complex disease with many faces, no one man or woman, no one organization can defeat it alone. We need to think creatively about the ways in which we can work together to end addiction before it starts. And as um, the pastor had noted, some of these partners might be obvious, our hospitals, clinics, and treatment professionals, but in looking around, the schools, law enforcement, social service providers, certainly our faith communities, the courts, housing specialists, parks and rec, media, business, youth leaders, barber shops, each can bring something to the effort of delivering prevention, intervention, treatment and recovery services, and just support to those who are struggling with addiction. Now, if you're not already connected to what's going on in your community, please join a coalition. Visit the website of the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. So we've got that website up there. It's also in the toolkit. Or join or start or read about recovery community organizations. Um, and then we also have 10 regional offices for HHS, and our office would be happy to connect you to those offices as well who are overseeing local and regional coalitions. 
Each community has particular needs and diverse assets, and our hope is that you will join with other partners to strengthen local approaches that make sense for your community. Now, before we close, I would like to draw your attention to the toolkit. On the back of the toolkit is a robust list of federal resources that are listed, including those provided by many of our subject matter experts that are listed on the slide, CDC, SAMHSA, NIDA, um, the Office of Adolescent Health, the Drug Enforcement Agency. This is um, this toolkit is live on our website, so that means that as we find new resources, we lift them up to the, the website and um, make sure that they're accessible and downloadable to you all and your community. Um, so please do be in touch with us if there's any questions you have about those resources or you see something that we should know about. We'd certainly like to, to hear from you. Um, this epidemic knows no boundaries. It defies class, religious, race, and economic delineations. Opioid addiction has become one of the least prejudicial public health crises we've seen. It attempts to take the joy, the vitality, and the future from every population in the nation. Our hope for restoration and healing lies in our confidence that the wisdom, resources, and intelligence to much of what is needed to restore and heal our communities and prevent future generations from harm already exist in congregations and communities around the country. Our hope is to come alongside and support that rich reservoir with additional skills, educational opportunities, and even resources to advance efforts that would be supported by facts, characterized by action, and inspired by hope. So thank you for, to each and every one of you for joining us today. Thank you, Pastor Delaney, and I'm going to turn it now over to Ben and see if we have time for questions. Thanks, Heidi, and Pastor Delaney, such amazing presentations today. Thanks so much for all the information you're sharing and for the helpful tools and ideas. Uh, just some amazing content that we've been privileged to participate in today. Um, trying, we're getting some amazing questions, and so uh, we want to, first off, if we don't get a chance to get to your question, uh, we'll try and ca capture it, but the best way to make sure we get in touch and follow up is through our email address, that's partnerships. Partnerships, plural, at hhs.gov. It's right there on the screen right now. So um, let's get to some of these questions. But if you don't see an answer, please send us an email, and we'll try and get back to you as soon as we can. The first question comes from Lisa. Um, she specifically asked about any programs that are helping family members struggling with addiction. What advice would we have to family members who have loved ones who are struggling? Uh, what would be some ideas and perspectives to share with them? Heidi, Pastor Delaney? Well, I think that, um, and thanks for the question, I, I think some of the traditional uh, organizations, your Al-Anon, Naranon, uh, those are excellent places for, uh, you know, family member to go, to begin to unpack that. Um, within the Celebrate Recovery Framework, if you can find an organization or one of those meetings around you, uh, they are designed to, to also have small groups that, that help family members. Uh, we've actually seen in here in Ohio an organization come up uh, through the ranks called Families of Addicts which is presenting a model that is replicatable, and uh, I can get to uh, the question, the person who raised the question, to let them see, but it has been a wonderful tool of bringing both the one that's suffering in substance use disorder and their family together in a healthy environment in order to move both parties forward uh, as they begin to recover together. Oh, that's super. Um, and, and I'd like to add to that, uh, there's a couple of especially ways to connect with, with good work that's happening in boys and girls clubs across the country. They have programs like Smart Moves and uh, that really aim to support young people and teen resilience and their families. The National 4-H is leaning hard into this issue as well, so um, finding out if they're in your community, if that's possible to connect. YMCAs are also starting to just develop the, the intentional program about how they support young people and their families, but also with that kind of intentionality around um, expanding that to supporting people who are dealing with substance use disorders in their community. And then I would also appoint you to um, the resources that are in the toolkit or in, and online. There's a couple of just, and these are written, and I know they're not the kind of immediate response um, program that you might be looking for, but there's great uh, tools and just guidance for families and parents from NIDA and the Office of Adolescent Health that could be very helpful in just also pointing you in the right direction. Excellent. 
Let's grab another question here from Eric. Uh, we know that part of the challenge of this crisis relates to prescription opioid drugs. What are some things that faith and community leaders can do to address the prescription component of the opioid crisis? Heidi, maybe this is a chance to talk about some of the work that uh, CDC has done around the prescription guidelines yeah, and making right. sure that faith and community leaders, so faith leaders can make sure that doctors and people working in the medical profession can know about some of these prescription guidelines. That's right. I think that so the CDC has done and they are doing new prescriber guidelines as we speak. They came out with a new um, revised uh, uh, guideline about a month and a half ago. But also they have uh, some interactive maps that show you where some of the uh, subscription and oversubscribing levels are across the country. And so, but that seems like a little high, you know, high up there. I think when we talk about faith, the community level response is in many ways is to be a very, very good consumer of pain management and understand that the kind of questions that we went through to understand when is an opioid appropriate and when may it be too much? What is the appropriate amount of opioid, opioids that one should take? And that's by bringing that expertise into your community and helpfully educate yourself and your community on those, um, those guidelines. And also, um, another thing we're starting to see that communities are doing as in response to this prescription or the over-prescription is to run take-back days in their communities and work with their local, local law enforcement or attorney general's office. And um, it turns out there's 50.5% of overdoses on prescription drugs come from family or friends. And the correlation or the assumption underneath that is that they were in the house and they were not um, being used. It was from an over-prescription. So, uh, and those, a lot of those we link to in our toolkit just direct you to those. Um, but that's just not, so just, it's so in, in any other words, it's, look to your community partners and have them help you with that conversation. What's the right conversation for your community? Pastor Delaney, let me jump to you on that point that Heidi made. One of our uh, couple of different practitioners, one, uh, Lorraine, is getting a new program started, wants to try and reach out to her community. But even some people in her community are kind of saying, well, there's not really a problem. They don't really believe that there's a problem with this. Um, another professional, um, uh, Juan from Arizona, I believe, uh, was sharing that you know he's a preven preven prevention professional and trying to reach out to community-based partners, but but having kind of a hard time connecting. So, uh, Pastor Delaney, how do we do the outreach to our communities, like Heidi's talking about? How do we connect to leaders out in the community and really kind of get this on the ra on the radar screen of more leaders and think about how they can get involved? Well, I think in our particular regard was, um, you know, we, we didn't have anybody coming to us. And so what we wanted to do was begin to educate ourselves as to what those perceptions were. And so we began to go to those, uh, you know, meetings and those uh, collaboratives that were in talking about the problem in, in general. I think one of the challenges that we have, that, that I haven't encountered so much in Ohio because we are kind of at the epicenter of this, is that head in the sand that we don't have this really going on. One way that we have engaged uh, the community here in Ohio, I'll give you a good example, was in the, the community of Bexley. Bexley is a rather affluent uh, area of suburb of Columbus. Um, they were of, of the impression that they didn't have this going on. Through a partnership with the Attorney General, we just wanted to bring an awareness day about uh, what was going on. We invited the school, we invited some leaders and brought them in. And then when presented with the fact, about their own community, suddenly some some uh, some eyes were opened, some some real uh, clarity came that this was going on around them, and uh, that began to spark uh, the opportunity for that community to look at it differently, to no longer be in that denial, but to say, look, we really need to take a hard look at what's happening around us. So. I think that, um, you know, first of all, going out to them, and second of all, um, you know, partnering a little bit with, um, with those that are dealing with it and asking them, is your, asking your sheriff, asking your local EMS, asking your, your local uh, physicians, if that may, your ERs, what are you folks experiencing and how can we potentially help and how do we get the word out together that this truly is um, not as, it, as it's being perceived to be in our community. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, so leverage those voices that are seeing this crisis. Create platforms for those leaders to share what they're seeing and, and bring other faith and community leaders to the table to say, listen, like, this person's seeing it on the ground, like, you know, this is a crisis. How can we address it and work together to support 
this local leader who's who's kind of on the front lines uh, seeing this challenge. I think another thing you can do, um, one for uh, just a, an idea, is is connect with leaders beyond the problem. Reach out and say, I'd just like to connect and come over and hear about the work you're doing. Um, you know, don't reach out because you have something you've got to work on. Reach out because you want to connect with that program. Learn more about the great work they're doing and build a relationship more that's about that's about transforming the community rather than transacting, you're working with me, I'm working with you. Build those strong relationships and the outcomes will come from some of that. Uh, Pastor Lini, on that point as well, and again, I want to recognize we're going over, but we have some great questions, just one or two more. Um, what are some ways you measure success when you're doing this work in the community? What are some ways that, that kind of are markers that what you're doing is, is kind of connecting and making a difference? Well, part of the challenge for faith organizations for the longest time is that our data tends to be a little anecdotal. And uh, when we have begun to bridge uh, this gap between those that are the data folks in, in, in you know, Adams boards and mental health and recovery solutions and that kind of thing to us who our stories are what tell the great work that we're doing with us. Um, you know, we have begun to try to figure out how can we begin to understand each other's language. But a lot of it does begin with the stories of success. And it's bringing those stories of success into the platform where the crisis is still going on. That's how we're measuring that we're making a difference. But at the same time, as we are engaging efforts in a community, we're looking for things that are measurable. A good example of that would be in Pike County, Ohio, which is in the Appalachian part of our state. We have an infant mortality rate of about 17 to every 1,000 children that pass away before the age of one due to the epidemic. We have gone in together with faith leaders and community leaders and said, we want that number to get reduced. So how do we begin to impact that number? and really focusing on that and putting our efforts together. And so we're starting to learn on our side of this fence with faith uh, leaders and others that we need to start looking for ways to measure what we're doing in addition to the good story of Johnny or Judy who are you know, out there telling their recovery uh, journey and their recovery success. That's excellent, and I appreciate you know noting that uh, it's an ongoing process. It's a learning process that we can all be in to figure out what success looks like, and that success is going to look different in every community. So, uh, the last questions that we have here uh, for both uh, Pastor Delaney and Heidi uh, really connect to stigma, and I think it's a great place for us to uh, like question to end, but it's also where the work begins out in the community. So. You know, some leaders talk, some questions related to um, how some people perceive that that uh, the opioid epidemic relates to crime in their community. So, in, inviting and welcoming in people who've experienced addiction is going to kind of not be safe or not be um, something that's going to increase crime. Um, another p uh, com question was just about um, people who've experienced relapse and acknowledging that um, you know, when somebody goes into a relapse, how do we respond to that? How do we create a welcoming and safe environment for someone who sh kind of addiction is something that we struggle with uh, uh, of course the, across the life course, not just at one time. So what are some things that we can do um, you know, right away to address some of those, those uh, perceptions of individuals in recovery? How do we create supportive and caring environments moving forward? Um, and really, how is that something that we can do as soon as we get off this call to start addressing the problem right away? Well, you know, I'm going to defer to the pastor on this because I think I, I, from the it's partnership center, what we're certainly um, encouraging is just to, to be educated, to join with others who can come into your community and just open your eyes. It's hard to be compassionate to something you just don't understand. But I, I'd like to hear the pastor's response to this. I think it begins with uh, language. And it begins with if, if we've understood this and, and all the debate is the disease, is it a moral failing, and, and so much points to you know, the disease model, which is, has been hard, I'll be honest. It's been hard for faith communities and churches to get uh, their head around that. But what we're seeing is a good place to start is in the use of language. Um, stigma is, is rooted in that. And so uh, instead of using words like addict or abuser or, abuser or junkies, perhaps uh, switching that to a person with a substance use disorder. When you're dealing with relapse, recognizing that if you're educated on this, this is a chronic relapsing brain disease. Uh, average relapse for a person dealing with this might be seven times. So how do I find the balance between grace and the law, grace and consequence? And that comes from understanding what the individual is going through. I think Heidi made a wonderful point about being focused a little bit more on what's happened to that individual rather than what's wrong with them. 
Um, some other areas where we're starting to see some traction is, is getting out of the habit of, of, of saying people are dirty or clean. Uh, perhaps that they are substance free rather than, than clean so we don't have the perception that they're dirty. Um, you know, in terms of saying a user, a person engaged in the risky use of a substance. I know it sounds uh, almost like semantics, but it's super important because what it does, it begins to separate the individual's identity from their behavior. And as one who has suffered in this area, it, it's very difficult when you are labeled as something, as a diagnosis, rather than, you know, um, you know, you wouldn't go up to somebody and say, well, there's, there's Joe the diabetic. You know, Joe diabetic. You no, know, you say that's Joe, and man, he's got diabetes. You wouldn't. That's that's kind of the idea here. So so part of that begins there. It begins with an understanding of the, of the challenge, but it also begins to understand how do I better use language so that the people that I'm trying to serve don't feel that I'm marginalizing them, minimizing them, or you know, linking their identity to their to their behavior. Excellent. These are all so great. I'm, I'm trying, you might hear me type, and I'm trying to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, so it's been great. We're 10 minutes over, so I want to begin the wrap up. Uh, this has been such a powerful time. We are excited uh, moving forward over the next few months uh, through the November and December time frame to uh, hear more stories. Tell us about the work you're doing in your community. Send us an email address to send us an email to that email address on the screen right now. Tell us about how you're seeing success in your community. To Pastor Delaney points, what are some ways that you're measuring success, um, making a difference? What are some things that you're seeing uh, groups lead on? We've already heard some great examples that people have typed into us. We want to invite you to share more uh, through our partnership stress. We want to hear about examples, and we want to think about how we can highlight those as a part of the toolkit. And then moving forward, early next year, we're excited to begin a new series that will share even more stories, just like Pastor Delaney's of people who are putting the toolkit elements into practice, people who are um, doing this work in local communities across the country in various forms and fashion. So um, uh, send us emails, let us know, and look for an, an email notice sometime in December for a webinar series that you can participate in that will highlight and share even more uh, stories that we talked about at the beginning, stories of hope, stories that of people who are really uh, addressing this crisis head on and uh, are building their capacity of their community to address these challenges in real and meaningful ways. I want to thank our presenters again. I want to let you guys know that we had so many people very graciously uh, thankful for the presentations that you both made today. We're excited to uh, participate in this ongoing dialogue and to be continuing to provide support to leaders in communities who are addressing this crisis and encourage more to be done because we know that the crisis is one that will require all of us to participate in the solution that's happening in our communities. Email us with your comments, thoughts at partnerships at hhs.gov. We look forward to hearing from you there. And thank you so much again for your participation today. Have an amazing day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.